Hi everyone, this is a speech in English about something called the Good Country Index. Um, it will be good for practicing SIM or CONSEC and essentially my speech will give you an overview about the Good Country Index, the countries which figure on it, how the Good Country Index is measured and some of the criticisms that it faces. So without further ado, my speech will start now. Ladies and gentlemen, if, like me, you pay keen attention to what's going on in the world and have maybe travelled a bit, then I've no doubt that you will have seen at least one of the well-known pieces of research that seeks to rank nations according to metrics such as national happiness, per capita income, human development, civil liberties or social mobility. And if you have seen any one of these rankings, you'll know that there's little surprise in which countries tend to come out on top. There's usually our Scandinavian neighbours, Denmark, Norway and Sweden, vying for first place. And of course, whichever one of them doesn't come first, Nelly always takes second and third place, which is no great shame. Then there tends to be one of our Anglophone cousins, either Canada or New Zealand taking fourth, with somewhere like Switzerland coming in at a perfectly respectable fifth. The UK usually ranks something very forgettable like 15th. And I must say, if you've ever visited any of those countries I've just mentioned, you may well agree that they deserve recognition for being world leaders in areas that matter. But Today, I'd like to talk to you about an international ranking of nations which is produced annually by a team of volunteer researchers that you may not have heard of, but which, in my opinion, really should get more attention. It's called the Good Country Index, and it was first published in 2014 as the brainchild of Simon Anholt, who's an independent consultant who works with governments around the world to help them leverage their country's soft power more effectively and improve their national image. I actually found out about the Good Country Index when I attended a TED talk given by Simon Anholt himself. And I found it so interesting and relevant that I really wanted to share my thoughts about it with you today. Now, you can find out all about it simply by visiting www.goodcountry.org, but this speech will hopefully give you an interesting overview. So first of all, what makes a good country and why was this index created to begin with? Well, as I've learned, all the usual international rankings tend to focus on each country as if it were a bubble looking at the pros and cons of a country's policy making from the point of view of that country's own citizens. But the Good Country Index goes one step further and posits that in a globalised world, a country no longer exists purely to serve its own citizens, but actually serves the entire world, for good or for bad, through its leaders' decision making. So whilst we may typically hear that Danes are the happiest people on the planet, which may well be true, the Good Country Index would look at how happy Denmark makes the world, since the consequences of policy making don't stop at a country's borders, obviously. Or, to put it another way, and using the UK as an example, a country might well be doing well in reducing its carbon emissions and transitioning towards green energy, as well as um, in providing free universal health care or funding scientific and technological innovation. But at the same time, that very same country might be exporting arms to Saudi Arabia, which are being used to kill thousands in Yemen, or looking to break away from a political and economic union at great cost to citizens both home and abroad. So all things considered, what is the country's net effect on the world? Is it more good or is it more bad? And I think this is a really interesting basis for a study and I'm surprised it hasn't garnered more publicity since when you think about it, this seems like a really obvious thing to measure. 
rather than just looking inwards at national statistics and discrete political entities. The goal, therefore, of the Good Country Index is to aim to change the way countries govern, not just for the benefit of their own, but for the world as a whole. So how is this research carried out? Well, basically, a team of volunteer researchers led by Simon Anholt number crunch huge amounts of annual data about countries and that data falls into one of seven broad categories. One, contribution to science, technology and knowledge. Two, contribution to culture. Three, contribution to international peace and security. Four, contribution to world order. Five, contribution to the planet and climate. Six, contribution to prosperity and equality. Seven, contribution to health and well-being. Now, each of these seven categories is then subdivided into a further five more specific subcategories, giving a total of 35 unique metrics of a country's net contribution to the world. Some of these 35 metrics are so-called negative indicators, which make a country less good, such as the number of refugees from that country, the country's total UNESCO dues in arrears as a percentage of their overall contribution, or the country's CO2 emissions relative to GDP. Other metrics are positive and serve to move the country up through the rankings, such as the number of Nobel Prize winners relative to GDP, the number of refugees hosted by that country relative to GDP, or voluntary excess contributions to the World Health Organization relative to GDP. <coughs> so now you know how the Good Country Index works, I'm sure you're dying to know the answer to the million dollar question, which is, which is the goodest country? How does your country fare on the list? For a detailed look, I'd refer you back to the website, as for now, I'm just going to give you a flavour of some of the results. So coming in pride of place at number one in the latest index is none of the countries that I mentioned earlier. In fact, it's Finland, whose average score across all of the metrics makes it the best country in the world in 2018. Surprised? I was. What a dark horse Finland seems to be. Never often making the news, but nevertheless quietly just getting on with making the world a better place. Go Finland. In fact, the top 10 countries were Finland, the Netherlands, Ireland, Sweden, Germany, Denmark, Switzerland, Norway, France and Spain. No surprises that all three Scandinavian countries make the top 10, but certainly I was pleasantly surprised by Ireland. Again, another small country that never really seems to make many headlines, Brexit notwithstanding, but which by all accounts makes a global contribution wholly disproportionate to the amount of praise and attention it actually receives. And just to hammer home that point, it's worth mentioning that Ireland came first in the very first Good Country Index, from 2014. You might be interested to know that the UK came in 15th in the 2018 index and the USA came in 40th. A shockingly bad result in my opinion for the so-called land of the free but then again with Trump in the White House building a border wall and pulling out of the Paris Agreement on climate change maybe that's no real surprise. China was 61st. So what about the bottom of the scale? Which are the worst countries? Which countries should be ashamed of themselves? Well, in descending order, starting with the country which scored the worst, in 153rd place, we have Iraq, followed by Libya, Mauritania, Yemen, Suriname, Gabon, Angola, Papua New Guinea, Mali and Guinea. I say which countries should be ashamed of themselves, but 
Is that a fair representation of the facts? In fact, that leads logically to a discussion about criticism of the Good Country Index, since, in my opinion, there is a large risk of tarring a huge amount of people with the same brush. Think about it. The index is based on the consequences of political decision-making felt around the world. But how many people in any one country actually hold the power to make impactful decisions? Very few. For example, the UK's population is around 66 million. But out of that number, only 650 people, our MPs, form the legislature. So if 650 people are responsible for making decisions which have disastrous consequences globally, take the invasion of Iraq in 2003, for example, can an entire country be justifiably held responsible for catastrophically bad decision making on the part of its politicians? Arguably not, given the many millions of ordinary citizens that took to the streets to protest this military action. One solution way around this could be to have a good city index where we look at smaller populations and assess their net impact on the world. And I think this would be a good way of making the index more representative of ordinary people. So there you have it. I hope I've inspired you to go and check out the Good Country Index for yourself and maybe learn a thing or two about countries that might not have been on your radar previously. I know this has made me feel very interested to go and visit Finland and see for myself what makes it good country number one, but I'd better do it quickly. After all, one of the metrics that the index measures is how many countries a citizen of any given country can visit without needing a visa. And given the UK's impending withdrawal from the European Union, I might find myself suffering the consequences of my country slipping even further down the ranks.